Francis Bacon, Wikipedia Audio Francis Bacon, 1st Viscount St. Alban, PCKC January 22, 1561 April 9, 1626 was an English philosopher, statesman, scientist, jurist, orator, and author. He served both as Attorney General and as Lord Chancellor of England. After his death, he remained extremely influential through his works, especially as philosophical advocate and practitioner of the scientific method during the scientific revolution. Bacon has been called the father of empiricism. His works argued for the possibility of scientific knowledge based only upon inductive reasoning and careful observation of events in nature. Most importantly, he argued this could be achieved by use of a skeptical and methodical approach whereby scientists aim to avoid misleading themselves. While his own practical ideas about such a method, the Baconian method, did not have a long-lasting influence, the general idea of the importance and possibility of a skeptical methodology makes Bacon the father of scientific method. This marked a new turn in the rhetorical and theoretical framework for science, the practical details of which are still central in debates about science and methodology today. In addition to his work in the sciences, Bacon was also a venerable patron of libraries and developed a functional system for the cataloging of books by dividing them into three categories history, poesy, and philosophy which could further be divided into more specific subjects and subheadings. Bacon is the first recipient of the Queen's Council designation and was conferred in 1597 when Queen Elizabeth reserved Bacon as her legal adviser. After the accession of King James I in 1603, Bacon was knighted. He was later created Baron Verulam in 1618, and Viscount St. Alban in 1621. Because he had no heirs, both titles became extinct upon his death in 1626, at 65 years of age. Bacon died of pneumonia, with one account by John Aubrey stating that he had contracted the condition while studying the effects of freezing on the preservation of meat. He is buried at St. Michael's Church, St. Albans, Hertfordshire. Biography Francis Bacon was born on January 22, 1561 at York House near the Strand in London, the son of Sir Nicholas Bacon by his second wife, Anne Bacon, the daughter of the noted humanist Anthony Cook. His mother's sister was married to William Cecil, 1st Baron Burley, making Burley Bacon's uncle. Biographers believe that Bacon was educated at home in his early years owing to poor health, which would plague him throughout his life. He received tuition from John Walsall a graduate of Oxford with a strong leaning toward Puritanism. He entered Trinity College, Cambridge, on April 5, 1573 at the age of 12, living for three years there, together with his older brother Anthony Bacon under the personal tutelage of Dr. John Whitgift, future Archbishop of Canterbury. Bacon's education was conducted largely in Latin and followed the medieval curriculum. He was also educated at the University of Poitiers. It was at Cambridge that he first met Queen Elizabeth, who was impressed by his precocious intellect, and was accustomed to calling him the young Lord Keeper. Scientific works in which his ideas for a universal reform of knowledge into scientific methodology and the improvement of mankind's state using the scientific method are presented, religious and literary works in which he presents his moral philosophy and theological meditations, juridical works in which his reforms in English law are proposed. His studies brought him to the belief that the methods and results of science as then practiced were erroneous. 
his reverence for Aristotle conflicted with his rejection of Aristotelian philosophy, which seemed to him barren, disputatious, and wrong in its objectives. On June 27, 1576, he and Anthony entered De Societate Magistrorum at Gray's Inn. A few months later, Francis went abroad with Sir Amias Paulat, the English ambassador at Paris, while Anthony continued his studies at home. The state of government and society in France under Henry III afforded him valuable political instruction. For the next three years he visited Blois, Poitiers, Tours, Italy, and Spain. During his travels, Bacon studied language, statecraft, and civil law while performing routine diplomatic tasks. On at least one occasion he delivered diplomatic letters to England for Walsingham, Burley, and Leicester, as well as for the Queen. The sudden death of his father in February 1579 prompted Bacon to return to England. Sir Nicholas had laid up a considerable sum of money to purchase an estate for his youngest son, but he died before doing so, and Francis was left with only a fifth of that money. Having borrowed money, Bacon got into debt. To support himself, he took up his residence in law at Gray's Inn in 1579, his income being supplemented by a grant from his mother Lady Anne of the Manor of Marks near Romford in Essex, which generated a rent of £46. Bacon stated that he had three goals, to uncover truth, to serve his country, and to serve his church. He sought to further these ends by seeking a prestigious post. In 1580, through his uncle, Lord Burley, he applied for a post at court that might enable him to pursue a life of learning, but his application failed. For two years he worked quietly at Gray's Inn, until he was admitted as an outer barrister in 1582. His parliamentary career began when he was elected MP for Bossini, Cornwall, in a by-election in 1581. In 1584 he took his seat in Parliament for Malcolm in Dorset, and in 1586 for Taunton. At this time, he began to write on the condition of parties in the Church, as well as on the topic of philosophical reform in the lost tract Temporis Partis Maximus. Yet he failed to gain a position that he thought would lead him to success. He showed signs of sympathy to Puritanism, attending the sermons of the Puritan chaplain of Gray's Inn and accompanying his mother to the Temple Church to hear Walter Traverse. This led to the publication of his earliest surviving tract, which criticized the English Church's suppression of the Puritan clergy. In the Parliament of 1586, he openly urged execution for the Catholic Mary. Queen of Scots. Using cases as repositories of evidence about the unwritten law, determining the relevance of precedents by exclusionary principles of evidence and logic, treating opposing legal briefs as adversarial hypotheses about the application of the unwritten law to a new set of facts. About this time, he again approached his powerful uncle for help. This move was followed by his rapid progress at the bar. He became a bencher in 1586 and was elected a reader in 1587, delivering his first set of lectures in Lent the following year. In 1589, he received the valuable appointment of reversion to the clerkship of the Star Chamber although he did not formally take office until 1608, the post was worth £1,600 a year. In 1588 he became MP for Liverpool and then for Middlesex in 1593. He later sat three times for Ipswich and once for Cambridge University. 
Essays, The Advancement and Proficience of Learning Divine and Human, Essays, Novum Organum Scientiarum, Essays, or Councils Civil and Moral, New Atlantis. Early Life He became known as a liberal-minded reformer, eager to amend and simplify the law. Though a friend of the crown, he opposed feudal privileges and dictatorial powers. He spoke against religious persecution. He struck at the House of Lords in its usurpation of the money bills. He advocated for the Union of England and Scotland, which made him a significant influence toward the consolidation of the United Kingdom, and he later would advocate for the integration of Ireland into the Union. Closer constitutional ties, he believed, would bring greater peace and strength to these countries. Bacon soon became acquainted with Robert Devereux, 2nd Earl of Essex, Queen Elizabeth's favourite. By 1591 he acted as the Earl's confidential adviser. In 1592 he was commissioned to write a tract in response to the Jesuit Robert Parson's anti-government polemic, which he titled Certain Observations Made Upon a Libel, identifying England with the ideals of democratic Athens against the belligerence of Spain. Bacon took his third parliamentary seat for Middlesex when in February 1593 Elizabeth summoned Parliament to investigate a Roman Catholic plot against her. Bacon's opposition to a bill that would levy triple subsidies in half the usual time offended the Queen, opponents accused him of seeking popularity, and for a time the court excluded him from favour. When the office of Attorney General fell vacant in 1594, Lord Essex's influence was not enough to secure the position for Bacon and it was given to Sir Edward Coke. Likewise, Bacon failed to secure the lesser office of Solicitor General in 1595, the Queen pointedly snubbing him by appointing Sir Thomas Fleming instead. To console him for these disappointments, Essex presented him with a property at Twickenham, which Bacon subsequently sold for £1,800. In 1597 Bacon became the first Queen's Council designate, when Queen Elizabeth reserved him as her legal counsel. In 1597, he was also given a patent, giving him precedence at the bar. Despite his designations, he was unable to gain the status and notoriety of others. In a plan to revive his position he unsuccessfully courted the wealthy and young widow Lady Elizabeth Hatton. His courtship failed after she broke off their relationship upon accepting marriage to Sir Edward Coke, a further spark of enmity between the men. In 1598 Bacon was arrested for debt. Afterward, however, his standing in the Queen's eyes improved. Gradually, Bacon earned the standing of one of the learned councils. His relationship with the Queen further improved when he severed ties with Essex a shrewd move, as Essex would be executed for treason in 1601. With others, Bacon was appointed to investigate the charges against Essex. A number of Essex's followers confessed that Essex had planned a rebellion against the Queen. Bacon was subsequently a part of the legal team headed by the Attorney General Sir Edward Coke at Essex's treason trial. After the execution, the Queen ordered Bacon to write the official government account of the trial which was later published as a declaration of the practices and treasons attempted and committed by Robert late Earl of Essex and his complices, against Her Majesty and her kingdoms, after Bacon's first draft was heavily edited by the Queen and her ministers. Parliamentarian Final Years of the Queen's Reign According to his personal secretary and chaplain, William Raleigh, 
as a judge Bacon was always tender-hearted, looking upon the examples with the eye of severity, but upon the person with the eye of pity and compassion. And also that he was free from malice, no revenger of injuries, and no defamer of any man. James I comes to the throne. Lord Chancellor and Public Disgrace Personal Life Marriage to Alice Barnum Homosexuality The succession of James I brought Bacon into greater favor. He was knighted in 1603. In another shrewd move, Bacon wrote his apologies in defense of his proceedings in the case of Essex, as Essex had favored James to succeed to the throne. The following year, during the course of the uneventful first Parliament session, Bacon married Alice Barnum. In June 1607 he was at last rewarded with the office of Solicitor General. The following year, he began working as the clerkship of the Star Chamber. Despite a generous income, old debts still could not be paid. He sought further promotion and wealth by supporting King James and his arbitrary policies. In 1610 the fourth session of James's first Parliament met. Despite Bacon's advice to him, James and the Commons found themselves at odds over royal prerogatives and the King's embarrassing extravagance. The House was finally dissolved in February 1611. Throughout this period Bacon managed to stay in the favour of the King while retaining the confidence of the Commons. Death In 1613 Bacon was finally appointed Attorney General, after advising the King to shuffle judicial appointments. As Attorney General, Bacon by his zealous efforts which included torture to obtain the conviction of Edmund Peacham for treason, raised legal controversies of high constitutional importance, and successfully prosecuted Robert Carr, 1st Earl of Somerset, and his wife, Frances Howard, Countess of Somerset, for murder in 1616. The so-called Prince's Parliament of April 1614 objected to Bacon's presence in the seat for Cambridge and to the various royal plans that Bacon had supported. Although he was allowed to stay, Parliament passed a law that forbade the Attorney General to sit in Parliament. His influence over the King had evidently inspired resentment or apprehension in many of his peers. Bacon, however, continued to receive the king's favor, which led to his appointment in March 1617 as temporary regent of England, and in 1618 as Lord Chancellor. On July 12, 1618 the king created Bacon Baron Verulam, of Verulam, in the peerage of England, he then became known as Francis, Lord Verulam. Bacon continued to use his influence with the king to mediate between the throne and parliament, and in this capacity he was further elevated in the same peerage, as Viscount St. Alban, on January 27, 1621. Bacon's public career ended in disgrace in 1621. After he fell into debt, a parliamentary committee on the administration of the law charged him with 23 separate counts of corruption. His lifelong enemy, Sir Edward Coke, who had instigated these accusations, was one of those appointed to prepare the charges against the Chancellor. To the Lords, who sent a committee to inquire whether a confession was really his, he replied, My Lords, it is my act, my hand, and my heart, I beseech your lordships to be merciful to a broken reed. He was sentenced to a fine of £40,000 and committed to the Tower of London at the King's pleasure, the imprisonment lasted only a few days and the fine was remitted by the King. More seriously, 
Parliament declared Bacon incapable of holding future office or sitting in Parliament. He narrowly escaped undergoing degradation, which would have stripped him of his titles of nobility. Subsequently, the disgraced Viscount devoted himself to study and writing. There seems little doubt that Bacon had accepted gifts from litigants, but this was an accepted custom of the time and not necessarily evidence of deeply corrupt behavior. While acknowledging that his conduct had been lax, he countered that he had never allowed gifts to influence his judgment and, indeed, he had on occasion given a verdict against those who had paid him. He even had an interview with King James in which he assured, The law of nature teaches me to speak in my own defense, with respect to this charge of bribery I am as innocent as any man born on St. Innocence Day. I never had a bribe or reward in my eye or thought when pronouncing judgment or order. I am ready to make an oblation of myself to the king. He also wrote the following to Buckingham. My mind is calm, for my fortune is not my felicity. I know I have clean hands and a clean heart, and I hope a clean house for friends or servants, but Job himself, or whoever was the justest judge, by such hunting for matters against him as hath been used against me, may for a time seem foul especially in a time when greatness is the mark and accusation is the game. Philosophy and Works The true reason for his acknowledgement of guilt is the subject of debate, but some authors speculate that it may have been prompted by his sickness, or by a view that through his fame and the greatness of his office he would be spared harsh punishment. He may even have been blackmailed with the threat to charge him with sodomy, into confession. The British jurist Basil Montague wrote in Bacon's defence, concerning the episode of his public disgrace. Influence Bacon has been accused of servility, of dissimulation, of various base motives, and their filthy brood of base actions, all unworthy of his high birth and incompatible with his great wisdom, and the estimation in which he was held by the noblest spirits of the age. It is true that there were men in his own time, and will be men in all times, who are better pleased to count spots in the sun than to rejoice in its glorious brightness. Such men have openly libeled him, like Dews and Weldon, whose falsehoods were detected as soon as uttered or have fastened upon certain ceremonious compliments and dedications, the fashion of his day, as a sample of his servility, passing over his noble letters to the Queen, his lofty contempt for the Lord Keeper Puckering, his open dealing with Sir Robert Cecil, and with others, who, powerful when he was nothing, might have blighted his opening fortunes forever, forgetting his advocacy of the rights of the people in the face of the court, and the true and honest counsels, always given by him, in times of great difficulty, both to Elizabeth and her successor. When was a base sycophant loved and honoured by piety such as that of Herbert, Tennyson, and Raleigh, by noble spirits like Hobbes, Ben Jonson, and Selden, or followed to the grave, and beyond it? with devoted affection such as that of Sir Thomas Modis. When he was thirty-six, Bacon courted Elizabeth Haddon, a young widow of twenty. Reportedly, she broke off their relationship upon accepting marriage to a wealthier man, Bacon's rival, Sir Edward Coke. Years later, Bacon still wrote of his regret that the marriage to Haddon had not taken place. Science North America Law At the age of 45, Bacon married Alice Barnum, the 14-year-old daughter of a well-connected London alderman and MP. Bacon wrote two sonnets proclaiming his love for Alice. The first was written during his courtship and the second on his wedding day, 
May 10, 1606. When Bacon was appointed Lord Chancellor, by special warrant of the King, Lady Bacon was given precedence over all other court ladies. Bacon's personal secretary and chaplain, William Raleigh, wrote in his biography of Bacon that his marriage was one of much conjugal love and respect, mentioning a robe of honour that he gave to Alice and which she wore unto her dying day, being twenty years and more after his death. However, an increasing number of reports circulated about friction in the marriage, with speculation that this may have been due to Alice's making do with less money than she had once been accustomed to. It was said that she was strongly interested in fame and fortune, and when household finances dwindled, she complained bitterly. Bunton wrote in her life of Alice Barnum that, upon their descent into debt, she went on trips to ask for financial favours and assistance from their circle of friends. Bacon disinherited her upon discovering her secret romantic relationship with Sir John Underhill. He subsequently rewrote his will, which had previously been very generous leaving her lands, goods and income and instead revoked it all. Several authors believe that despite his marriage Bacon was primarily attracted to the same sex. Forker, for example, has explored the historically documentable sexual preferences of King James and Bacon and concluded they were both orientated to masculine love, a contemporary term that seems to have been used exclusively to refer to the sexual preference of men for members of their own gender. The well-connected antiquary John Aubrey noted in his brief lives concerning Bacon, he was a pederast. His ganims and favourites took bribes. The Jacobean antiquarian, Sir Simons D. Hughes implied there had been a question of bringing him to trial for boogery, which his brother Anthony Bacon had also been charged with. This conclusion has been disputed by others, who point to lack of consistent evidence, and consider the sources to be more open to interpretation. Publicly, Bacon distanced himself from homosexuality. In his New Atlantis, Bacon describes his utopian island as being the chastest nation under heaven, in which there was no prostitution or adultery, and further saying that as for masculine love, they have no touch of it. On April 9, 1626, Francis Bacon died of pneumonia while at Arundel Mansion at Highgate outside London. An influential account of the circumstances of his death was given by John Aubrey's Brief Lives. Aubrey's vivid account, which portrays Bacon as a martyr to experimental scientific method, had him journeying to Highgate through the snow with the king's physician when he is suddenly inspired by the possibility of using the snow to preserve meat they were resolved they would try the experiment presently. They alighted out of the coach and went into a poor woman's house at the bottom of Highgate Hill, and bought a fowl, and made the woman exenterate it. After stuffing the fowl with snow, Bacon contracted a fatal case of pneumonia. Some people, including Aubrey, consider these two contiguous possibly coincidental events as related and causative of his death, the snow so chilled him that he immediately fell so extremely ill, that he could not return to his lodging, but went to the Earl of Arundel's house at Highgate, where they put him into, a damp bed that had not been lain in, which gave him such a cold that in two or three days as I remember Mr. Hobbs told me, he died of suffocation. Aubrey has been criticised for his evident credulousness in this and other works, on the other hand, he knew Thomas Hobbes, Bacon's fellow philosopher and friend. Being unwittingly on his deathbed, the philosopher wrote his last letter to his absent host and friend Lord Arundel. My very good lord I was likely to have had the fortune of Caius Plinius the Elder, who lost his life by trying an experiment about the burning of Mount Vesuvius, 
for I was also desirous to try an experiment or two touching the conservation and induration of bodies. As for the experiment itself, it succeeded excellently well, but in the journey between London and Highgate, I was taken with such a fit of casting as I know not whether it were the stone, or some surfeit or cold, or indeed a touch of them all three. But when I came to your lordship's house, I was not able to go back, and therefore was forced to take up my lodging here, where your housekeeper is very careful and diligent about me, which I assure myself your lordship will not only pardon towards him, but think the better of him for it. For indeed your lordship's house was happy to me, and I kiss your noble hands for the welcome which I am sure you give me to it. I know how unfit it is for me to write with any other hand than mine own, but by my troth my fingers are so disjointed with sickness that I cannot steadily hold a pen. Another account appears in a biography by William Raleigh, Bacon's personal secretary and chaplain. He died on the ninth day of April in the year 1626, in the early morning of the day then celebrated for our Saviour's resurrection, in the sixty-sixth year of his age, at the Earl of Arundel's house in Highgate, near London, to which place he casually repaired about a week before, God so ordaining that he should die there of a gentle fever, accidentally accompanied with a great cold, whereby the defluxion of room fell so plentifully upon his breast, that he died by suffocation. He was buried in St. Michael's Church in St. Albans. At the news of his death, over thirty great minds collected together their eulogies of him, which were then later published in Latin. He left personal assets of about £7,000 and lands that realised £6,000 when sold. His debts amounted to more than £23,000, equivalent to more than £3 million at current value. Francis Bacon's philosophy is displayed in the vast and varied writings he left, which might be divided into three great branches. Bacon's seminal work Novum Organum was influential in the 1630s and 1650s among scholars, in particular Sir Thomas Brown, who in his Encyclopedia Pseudodoxia Epidemica frequently adheres to a Baconian approach to his scientific inquiries. This book entails the basis of the scientific method as a means of observation and induction. During the Restoration, Bacon was commonly invoked as a guiding spirit of the Royal Society founded under Charles II in 1660. During the 18th century French Enlightenment, Bacon's non-metaphysical approach to science became more influential than the dualism of his French contemporary Descartes, and was associated with criticism of the Ancien Régime. In 1733 Voltaire introduced him to a French audience as the father of the scientific method, an understanding which had become widespread by the 1750s. In the 19th century his emphasis on induction was revived and developed by William Wool, among others. He has been reputed as the father of experimental philosophy. He also wrote a long treatise on medicine, history of life and death, with natural and experimental observations for the prolongation of life. One of his biographers, the historian William Hepworth Dixon, states, Bacon's influence in the modern world is so great that every man who rides in a train, sends a telegram, follows a steam plough, sits in an easy chair, crosses the Channel or the Atlantic, eats a good dinner, enjoys a beautiful garden, or undergoes a painless surgical operation, owes him something. In 1902 Hugo von Hofmannsthal published a fictional letter addressed to Bacon and dated 1603, about a writer who is experiencing a crisis of language. Known as the Lord Chandos Letter, 
it has been proposed that Bacon was identified as its recipient as having laid the foundation for the work of scientists such as Ernst Mach, notable both for his academic distinction in the history and philosophy of the inductive sciences, and for his own contributions to physics. Bacon played a leading role in establishing the British colonies in North America, especially in Virginia, the Carolinas, and Newfoundland in northeastern Canada. His government report on the Virginia colony was submitted in 1609. In 1610 Bacon and his associates received a charter from the king to form the Trace Eura and the Company of Adventurers and Planter of the City of London and Bristol for the colony or plan taken in Newfoundland, and sent John Guy to found a colony there. Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, wrote, Bacon, Locke and Newton. I consider them as the three greatest men that have ever lived, without any exception, and as having laid the foundation of those superstructures which have been raised in the physical and moral sciences. In 1910 Newfoundland issued a postage stamp to commemorate Bacon's role in establishing the colony. The stamp describes Bacon as the guiding spirit in colonization schemes in 1610. Moreover, some scholars believe he was largely responsible for the drafting, in 1609 and 1612, of two charters of government for the Virginia colony. William Hepworth Dixon considered that Bacon's name could be included in the list of founders of the United States. Although few of his proposals for law reform were adopted during his lifetime, Bacon's legal legacy was considered by the magazine New Scientist in 1961 as having influenced the drafting of the Napoleonic Code as well as the law reforms introduced by 19th-century British Prime Minister Sir Robert Peel. The historian William Hepworth Dixon referred to the Napoleonic Code as the sole embodiment of Bacon's thought saying that Bacon's legal work has had more success abroad than it has found at home, and that in France it has blossomed and come into fruit. Harvey Wheeler attributed to Bacon, in Francis Bacon's Verulamium the common law template of the modern in English science and culture, the creation of these distinguishing features of the modern common law system. As late as the 18th century some juries still declared the law rather than the facts, but already before the end of the 17th century Sir Matthew Hale explained modern common law adjudication procedure and acknowledged Bacon as the inventor of the process of discovering unwritten laws from the evidences of their applications. The method combined empiricism and inductivism in a new way that was to imprint its signature on many of the distinctive features of modern English society. Paul H. Kocher writes that Bacon is considered by some jurists to be the father of modern jurisprudence. Bacon is commemorated with a statue in Gray's Inn, South Square in London where he received his legal training and where he was elected treasurer of the inn in 1608. James McClellan, a political scientist from the University of Virginia, considered Bacon to have had a great following in the American colonies. More recent scholarship on Bacon's jurisprudence has focused on his advocating torture as a legal recourse for the Crown. Bacon himself was not a stranger to the torture chamber, in his various legal capacities in both Elizabeth I's and James I's reigns, Bacon was listed as a commissioner on five torture warrants. In 1613, in a letter addressed to King James I on the question of torture's place within English law, Bacon identifies the scope of torture as a means to further the investigation of threats to the state, in the cases of treasons torture is used for discovery, and not for evidence. For Bacon, torture was not a punitive measure, an intended form of state repression, 
but instead offered a modus operandi for the government agent tasked with uncovering acts of treason. The Baconian hypothesis of Shakespearean authorship, first proposed in the mid-19th century, contends that Francis Bacon wrote some or even all of the plays conventionally attributed to William Shakespeare. Francis Bacon often gathered with the men at Gray's Inn to discuss politics and philosophy, and to try out various theatrical scenes that he admitted writing. Bacon's alleged connection to the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons has been widely discussed by authors and scholars in many books. However, others, including Daphne du Maurier in her biography of Bacon, have argued that there is no substantive evidence to support claims of involvement with the Rosicrucians. Francis Yates does not make the claim that Bacon was a Rosicrucian, but presents evidence that he was nevertheless involved in some of the more closed intellectual movements of his day. She argues that Bacon's movement for the advancement of learning was closely connected with the German Rosicrucian movement, while Bacon's New Atlantis portrays a land ruled by Rosicrucians. He apparently saw his own movement for the advancement of learning to be in conformity with Rosicrucian ideals. The link between Bacon's work and the Rosicrucians' ideals which Yeats allegedly found was the conformity of the purposes expressed by the Rosicrucian manifestos and Bacon's plan of a great instauration, for the two were calling for a reformation of both divine and human understanding, as well as both had in view the purpose of mankind's return to the state before the fall. Another major link is said to be the resemblance between Bacon's New Atlantis and the German Rosicrucian Johann Valentin Andreas description of the Republic of Christianopolis. Andrea describes a utopic island in which Christian theosophy and applied science ruled, and in which the spiritual fulfillment and intellectual activity constituted the primary goals of each individual the scientific pursuits being the highest intellectual calling linked to the achievement of spiritual perfection. Andreas Island also depicts a great advancement in technology, with many industries separated in different zones which supplied the population's needs which shows great resemblance to Bacon's scientific methods and purposes. The Rosicrucian organization Amork claims that Bacon was the imperator of the Rosicrucian order in both England and the European continent, and would have directed it during his lifetime. Bacon's influence can also be seen on a variety of religious and spiritual authors, and on groups that have utilized his writings in their own belief systems. Some of the more notable works by Bacon are Historical Debates Bacon and Shakespeare Occult Hypotheses Bibliography Notes Citations Primary Sources Secondary Sources